Okay, so welcome to kind of the first episode or the first installment of a series of me learning Zig. If you've watched my previous video, I explained why I'm learning Zig. If you're interested, link will be in the description down below. It'll pop up somewhere here. But in this kind of video series, all I'm going to do is kind of recite what I learned in Zig and my current journey with what resource I'm using to learn Zig. So maybe if you want, you can learn with me if you have the time. So for this journey, obviously, I'm looking at ziglang.org, kind of the main hub of the official uh, documentation and the getting started for Zig. But I found this really, really good book called the Zig book on GitHub. I'm actually going to go ahead and give it a start. And it's made by uh, this individual named pa Pedro Park 99. And uh, this book was actually introduced to me by Loris, uh, the VP of communications for Zig. And I'm diving into it. So I finished chapter one. I'm going to basically showcase what I learned in this chapter and all the things I found pretty interesting with Zig. So the first thing is whenever you create a new project, just like GoMod init, you can have the zig init and it gives you this entire uh, zig project structure with a build.zig, build.zig.zon and a source directory with a main.zig and a root.zig. Now, what the author describes in this chapter is main.zig is used typically for like your application code, whereas root.zig is used for making library code as is stated right here by convention root.zig is a root source file when making a library and you can see our first function definition with the public keyword the fn keyword for a function and then the name of the function buffer print it takes no arguments and this exclamation point void now this exclamation point void basically means it's a union of an error and nothing so this function could return an error or it could return nothing as you can see here with the standard out flush operator this is how we're going to kind of run our buffered prints from the standard out uh, thing that we define up here. So our standard out writer, and then we have our standard out interface. And you can see here another example of a function. So public function add, we have our two arguments, A and B. A is of type integer 32, and so is B. This returns an integer type 32, and here it's returning A plus B. With an actual test example as well, which is pretty cool, of ba uh, basic add functionality. We have the test keyword, and then we can run this file. It would actually also run the test for us. Okay, so if I try to run this, and by the way, let me just quickly show you what version of Zig I'm on. So I'm on version, I'm on version 0 0.15.1. And if I try to run this, you can do zig run root.zig. And it's actually going to say you uh, root source struct root has no member named main. So just like in Go, which by the way, I'm going to be coming at this a lot from the perspective of a Go developer. This main.zig acts as a function named main main which seems to be like the main entry point for a bunch of zig applications went ahead and kind of copied everything from the uh, first chapter there so now if i do zig run main.go you can see oh sorry if i do zig run main.zig that's funny you can see it actually compiles everything and it runs hello world for us like this uh, but the author actually shows that you can do this zig build executable main.zig so i can do zig build dash exe and then main.zig and if I do an ls, I now have this main, which can just run like this. So this is how I compile everything to a very simple executable file. Okay, and this brings me to another very interesting topic about Zig is how do strings work in Zigs? So Zig doesn't have kind of this native type of a string. All strings are here. A string in Zig is essentially an array of arbitrary bytes or more specifically an array of unsigned eight values. This is very similar to a string in C, which also is interpreted as an array of arbitrary bytes or in the case of C, an array of character, which usually represents an unsigned eight bit integer value in most system values. So this took me a little time to wrap my head up. You can see string example, I can just write it like this, right? String example is some string here and zig will interpret this no no problem it's gonna say unused local constant and here i could say printing uh, a string you can see here printing a string some value here so it's not a problem to print the string we can actually modify it. so instead of putting c i can actually put uh, i think it's character or even d here to get the unicode representation nope okay is it x to get the hex rep representation but you can see here, I can get the hex representation of the string as well. And if I go back, um, let's see. So I can iterate through the string. So this is my string example here. Bytes that represent the string object. So, okay. And then I can iterate through the string literally with this kind of for loop syntax here. So if I copy this over here and change it to a string example, let's go ahead and just delete all this stuff just to give us some more room. If I save this and run this, you can see here now I get the byte representation of my string and each individual character specifically of my string. 
So I think for me in this chapter, some of the more difficult parts were again kind of the array syntax. It's still kind of a little messy for, for me. So here if I have a fixed length i of int 32, right, var int, and then I declare it so I can go here and put this at 1, 2, 3, 4, this is going to be fine. And I can also do const sum array. I can put an equal sign here. Let's say I don't know the length at runtime or at compile time, I should say, u8 and just put 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so these are two valid ways of creating a const array, sum array, and then a variable of the array as well. And you can see here, even with two consts, you can do some uh, array operations. So you can add the two arrays and a bunch of other things you can see here, const a very similar to the syntax I have here, right? The const declaration, the name of the array, and then what you have in the actual array uh, initialization. But I can even make an undefined array. So you can do a uh, undefined array and we can make the syntax like this. Let's say we don't know the length u8. I can just put this as undefined like so. And this is valid. Uh, unable to infer array at size. Oh, whoops, I guess it's not. So let's give it a size. Um, unused local. Yeah, so all of four of these are unused and these are all valid. Uh, the main difference here is this is not initialized, right? So the other two initialized because I have actual values in the body of my array. Well, this one is not, but I can set it because it's a variable to a different array and can kind of re uh, instantiate it like that. And so the ch chapter kind of also ended with the safety of Zig. Zig is a very big, safe language. It has a bunch of things that they talk about. And uh, yeah, it compares itself to Rust as well. And then, yeah, moving on, I'm going to be continuing with this book, going through every chapter. I've been doing this live on Twitch. If you're interested, go check me out there. But hopefully you guys get something out of this and I'll keep you guys updated with a lot of the things I'm going to be learning with Zig. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.